Okay, I was just saying that science just seems so certain when I hear that presentation, and clinical medicine is absolutely far from certain. So I want to very quickly run through uh, the use of uh, melatonergic drugs in older adults uh, for primary insomnia. Now, you have to get a, a differentiation clearly between primary and secondary insomnia, and it's primary insomnia that we're going to be talking about here. And primary insomnia, you, you, in the past we have tended to think of hypnotic drugs, sleep drugs, as promoting only sleep latency. That is why these drugs were in fact developed. But if you look at DSM-4, which is a standard criteria for clinical medicine, um, there is DSM-4, which is the way we diagnose primary insomnia, says that it can be difficulty initiating sleep, but that's one of the small bits or maintaining sleep, or indeed non-restorative sleep. That is, the, per the person is complaining that their sleep is wrong. And remember that sleep at the end of the day is a subjective complaint. You can't measure that someone is suffering from insomnia. The patient comes along and tells you that they are suffering from insomnia. But perhaps the most important bit of this slide is this bit down here. It's not enough just to have these. You must have some impairment in your social or your working life or other important areas of functioning such as, uh, your, uh, such as your family life. Now, sleep-related issues. Some people say, well, I just don't sleep when I get older. It's part of a natural part of aging. This is not the case. And in fact, sleep problems are a genuine problem. And I've put down here one or two figures that I took off the website from the UK from the Department of Transport. And this is only one small facet of insomnia, but it's something concrete that says sleep problems are a genuine problem. They cause a lot of sleep-related accidents. And what you can see from this slide is that as you can see, the prevalence of insomnia goes up with age. And when you get to over 70, you can see that 25% of patients have moderate to severe insomnia. So it is a very common problem in the elderly. And the way we treat it just now is tending to use hypnotics. This is a slightly older uh, study, but I suspect that it's not terribly much different now. About 1.5% of the population, and a lot of these will be elderly, are treated with hypnotics. And by hypnotics, we mean specifically benzodiazepine drugs and a little bit less the Z drugs. We are standing in the country where the use is by far highest of benzodiazepines anyway, apart from in a, for use in insomnia. And that's the kind of way in which they're used. Tamazepam is the most common. Most of them are prescribed by GPs, and most of them are for long-term use. Once someone gets started on them, and particularly older people, they tend to want to stay on them. And so there are concerns both about the efficacy of these drugs, because the efficacy does tail off with time, although the patients continue to want to take them, and there's also the question of abuse liability. There are some older people which have been shown uh, in some countries where the older people are getting the prescriptions and their grandchildren are selling or using the drugs. So, what about using CBT for insomnia? Can I just make a, a, just a mention of this, nothing else? That in fact, I looked at a, I don't know if you know about the Cochrane Review, but it's an independent review system which is used in medicine and it is usually reckoned to be independent and extremely authoritative. And what you could see, they could only find six trials in over 60s in insomnia in all of the medical literature and only 200 odd subjects. So there are very, very few studies. And, of course, CBT studies are very difficult. How do you do placebo CBT? It's almost impossible. People know what they're getting. And their conclusions were it might have a mild effect in older adults. It's best for sleep maintenance insomnia, that is, patients who, who waken up during the night. They probably have to get regular top-up provision. And 
it's impossible to predict who will respond to it and who will not. And I think probably more importantly, it depends who is giving the CBT and the relationship they have with the patient. So this is really not an adequate way for us to deal with insomnia. So if we turn to the melatonin secretion with which NAVA started the presentation, can we say that what we have is that as we all get older, there is a tendency for the, our melatonin production to slow down and it reduces. So with age, melatonin production reduces. The second thing is that if we look at healthy patients against insomnia patients, insomnia patients have a lower production of melatonin pa than, than in fact normal patients. So the two things we've got is that the older you are, your melatonin decreases, and if you have insomnia, you will tend to have lower melatonin than someone who is a normal individual. <coughs> so that leads us then to the hypothesis that reduced melatonin is correlated with sleep disorders. We know that melatonin reduces with age and melatonin production in, in elderly insomniacs is low. And therefore it is reasonable to think that elderly patients with chronic insomnia may well be a target for these drugs and may be more susceptible to the use of melatonergic drugs than the normal population or indeed the normal insomniac population. There are problems, however, with developing a drug like this. Melatonin has an extremely short half-life, somewhere between about 40 minutes and just over an hour. And what happens in the natural situation is that your body keeps producing melatonin during a nighttime situation. Therefore, if you're going to use melatonin, particularly for, for sleep awakenings during the night, it's a, there's a desperate need for a prolonged release preparation to overcome this difficulty of the short half-life. The second thing, and I'm a clinician, is that you have to make sure that this you understand, the clinicians understand, and the patient understands that this is a not a traditional hypnotic. It is not going to give them an instant sleep the first night you give it. And the other issue is that unlike the benzodiazepines, it will not have an impact on their memory. So if they ever are awake the first night, they'll remember they were awake, which they don't do with the benzodiazepines, of course. I'll come back to that. The other thing is, what endpoints do we want to use? It's not enough to use sleep latency, such as the benzodiazepines have all used. What we want is someone who gets a better quality of sleep, someone who's restored the next day, and somebody who can manage better the next day. So if we're going to look at these drugs, these are the things that we're looking for. We're not looking simply for them to put the patient to sleep. Here's what we have available at the moment. We have prolonged release melatonin, which is circadin, which is available in Europe and elsewhere in the world, but not in the US at present. We then have Romelteon, which of course is available in Europe. They did apply for a license in the EU, which in fact they did not get, and I'll explain why they didn't get it. And then the other drug, which there has been some information on is Tassimelteon, and that, in fact, is a drug which I've only seen studies which look at jet lag and shift workers. I haven't seen any other studies with that, but it's a similar type of a melatonin agonist. Then we have this interesting drug, agomelatin, which not only affects the melatonin system, but has a weak effect on the serotonin system. And in fact, it's being promoted as an antidepressant at present and is available most places in the world. But it's, thought, it's certainly not purely the melatonin effect which is, which is working in depression. It requires also the serotonergic effect. And the combination of the two may have some benefits over traditional SSRIs or serotonergic drugs. And there are lots of drugs under development also, but there are all at varying stages of development and many of them are pretty early in their development. However, there's a lot of interest in the field. Just a word about Romeltion before I move on. Um, it is a, a receptor agonist with a high affinity for these, for these receptors and it has a reasonably a long half-life. It is in America, it's indicated for the treatment of insomnia characterized by difficulty with sleep onset. In other words, the traditional latency theory is what it was based on and it got its license for 
in America. And the interesting thing is that whereas some of the other drugs have a restriction on use, that is up to four weeks usage, there is no restriction on Rosarem in the US uh, if you're treating latency. Now, um, the difficulty is really that we have an illness which by definition is a chronic illness and yet most of the drugs we use are in indicated only acutely. So there is an advantage in this no time restriction on use and it indicates a safety profile. However, the EMEA, which is the licensing body in Europe, has looked more carefully at hypnotic drugs for registration and it is not happy anymore to register a drug purely to put someone off to sleep. You have to show evidence that it does more than that and particularly you have to show that the next day functioning is improved by that patient's insomnia improving. Otherwise you will not get a license. And that's one of the issues which we faced with a prolonged release melatonin. Now, in fact, for most of the studies, this sleep, uh, lead sleep evaluation questionnaire was used, which is, uh, and in fact, what you can see here is, this is the, the percentage of patients showing an improvement. And this is a difficult figure, but it's, a, it's, it's an important clinical improvement. Let me just leave it at that, an important clinical improvement. And the percentage of responders, as you can see, was almost 50% here, was significantly better than placebo in studies which involved more than 500 patients. Now, if you look at the Cochrane Review, where they couldn't muster that in all the world literature, that is a significant number of patients. <laughs> This is the studies which were done. Um, these, are, these count for Neurum, which is the company that sponsored them. One, in fact, was a, a PSG study. It's a lab study. And these two were clinical studies, Neurum 7, Neurum 9. And you can see the number of patients that were involved within the studies. Now, in order to be called a responder, you had to show improvement both in the quality of sleep and functioning the next day which was felt to be morning alertness. It was not good enough to simply improve your sleep. You had to function the next day before you were a responder. And what you can see here is, well, the numbers in the lab study were too small to be analyzed. But in Neurum 7, with this relatively small number of patients, you get a difference from placebo here to the active drug there. And you can see that it's highly significant statistically. And similarly, in Neurim 9, where you've got even more patients, double the number of patients, you can see that there is a highly statistical difference between the two groups of patients. Now, all of these patients were over 55 years of age and all had significant insomnia. And when we pull all these numbers to get a meta-analysis, you see that you've got this very significant figure here. Now, the one criticism of this might be, or I, can th I think some people might feel, that the number of people responding at about a third of them is quite a low response rate. But let's think what we're having to do. We're having to, in fact, improve their quality of sleep and their morning alertness. And if we look at it, there are 50% of the patients in whom the quality of sleep improved. There are also another 40% in, in whom this is the, their behavior following wakefulness, in other words, how they're managing the next day. And it is this third of them who get both of these. So even if we only take a third here, we're getting almost two thirds with some improvement in their overall well-being. We also looked at quality of life. Now, probably most of you won't know this scale terribly well. It's a, w, it's a World Health Organization five-item scale of quality of life and was developed particularly with people for people with psychiatric disorders by Per Beck in Copenhagen. And in fact, there is a, it's a relatively small scale, as you can see, a possible of nothing to 15. And what you can see is that there is a significant difference between the active compound and the placebo in quality of life. And this indicates that the patients are benefiting from the treatment of their insomnia. They're feeling better. We've got responders. We've also got evidence of benefit in the quality of life of these patients. When we look at people who respond 
Now that's both of them, you know, both their, their sleep during the night and their behavior the following day, you get a huge difference in the quality of life of these patients. Now part of that will be due to the lack of adverse events associated with treatment with melatonin as opposed to the benzodiazepines. But since there's a full lecture on the adverse events, I don't want to intrude on that at present. But a big, big difference in quality of life in active versus uh, placebo non-responders. This is an interesting study because this is an independent study carried out by the Canadian Air Force and there are a number of these studies. And of course, most of the armed forces are looking for some ways of helping soldiers and airmen and everybody else sleep at night in stressful situations or in situations where they're maybe having to change their you know, work at night and sleep during the day, this kind of thing. And the Canadian Air Force, of course, were determined that they should use drugs which did not have an impact on the, the, the pilot's ability to react. And during this, this particular study, in fact, what you can see is that the sleep latency change, while it is positive for zopiclone 5 milligrams, was certainly much the same for the melatonin agonist circadian. And this is the placebo here. So it's taking them about 12.3 minutes, five minutes improvement there, and about five and a half minutes improvement there. You might not think these improvements are very much, but what you have to remember that even if these are normal young pilots in the Canadian Air Force, in elderly patients and in normal insomniacs, the improvement which allowed Zaliplon to be licensed, in fact, was about nine minutes on latency. So this is, you know, quite reasonable, if you like. Um, the other interesting thing is I mentioned the issue about memory and benzodiazepines because if you give someone benzodiazepines, even if they're up half the night, they won't remember it because it's got such an awful effect on their memory. And if you look at any of the studies where you compare PSG to clinical reports of how long it took the patient to get to sleep with a benzodiazepine, what you'll find is that if you actually measure it, it's about twice as long as they are reporting because of the memory issue. What you can see, in fact, with a PRM, in fact, is that, in fact, if you look at the subjective one, the patients report about a nine-minute improvement in the latency. And, in fact, in the objective study, Neurom 1, what you can see, it was about nine minutes different from placebo. In other words, the patient is not having their cognitive in function or their memory impaired by the melatonin, and therefore they are, they are reporting correctly. Uh, the issue. The other one is, the other important thing from a clinical point of view is there's, there was an interesting meta-analysis by this, uh, by Glass in the BMJ some time ago. Some of you will have seen it, where they reckoned that traditional hypnotics did more harm than good in the elderly. And I don't know if you know the concept of NNT, but the number needed to treat is basically the number of people you need to give a particular drug in order to get one patient with a better response or an outcome, all right? So in other words, if, uh, if half the people get better, the NNT would be two to one. Now, a, sort of an accepted normal for something that's worthwhile is about 15, an NNT of 15. You treat 15 patients, one of them gets the outcome you're looking for in addition to the number who get it on placebo. NNH is the number needed to harm, which is the opposite, the number of people who get an adverse event compared to the placebo. And what you can see is that with traditional hypnotics, an adverse event is twice as likely, it's going to happen in one in six patients, as a good outcome, which is one in 13. And that's well established with this article. If we look at all the prolonged release melatonin data here, what you can see is that the NNT is reversed and more than reversed. In other words, there is more people benefiting. One in seven of the people are benefiting. One in 19 are getting an adverse event, which is significant. Can I just mention, I said that a primary insomnia is a long-term disorder. It's a chronic disorder. You want to treat people. And to start with, we only had a short-term study which showed that by three weeks, these patients were benefiting from the drug. And as a long-term disorder, you want to be able to give long-term treatment. And what is the outcome of giving long-term treatment? And this is what we did. 
big number of patients, so it was a big exercise to run this study. 930 patients of MDs run clinical studies is a lot of patients. And they had a placebo run-in, which gave us the opportunity to check that it, there wasn't some reason for their insomnia, and they were genuinely primary insomnia, and they met various uh, severity criteria. They were then randomized one-to-one -one for either melatonin or placebo for three weeks, which was the original studies. And they were then randomized again, three to one, because the half that were on melatonin were continued on it, and the others were randomized to either melatonin or placebo. And it was a six-month study with a placebo run out just to make sure we had no withdrawal effects, which in fact there weren't. This also had, although the majority of the patients were elderly, there were some younger patients in it, which allowed us to look at low melatonin excretors in general against elderly patients. Uh, and in fact, what you see is that the age is a big function in when you're using these drugs. It appears to be more than just the low melatonin that's the situation. If we looked at the long-term effects, this is the six-month point here. This is the patients who are on placebo, and this is the patients who are on the active drug. And what you can see is that there is certainly, you know, up to about 10, 12 weeks, there's certainly a continuing improvement beyond our original three-week study, which is then maintained for the full six months. And if anything is enhanced a little bit, in as much as it becomes statistically more significant, probably associated with this drop-off in placebo, which of course is a fairly standard in clinical studies. This again is looking at the global Pittsburgh questionnaire, which is nowadays almost a standard questionnaire. The previous one I showed you was the Leeds, which was the short-term studies. This is the Pittsburgh, which is a standard sleep questionnaire. And again, you see the same effect here. And that is looking at the, the total Pittsburgh. We have looked at the various other components of it as well. And this is looking at morning alertness. And you can see that, in fact, the, this equates to how they'll feel the next day as uh, in the Pittsburgh. It's just a different way of expressing it. And you can see that, in fact, not only are they sleeping better relative to placebo, but they get this big benefit in how they feel the following day. These are all the other things we can measure. And what you can see is that in fact looking at patients 65 to 80 years of age we get sleep latency is improved dramatically there's this these are all latency things which you derive from the pittsburgh here the sleep onset which is a diary measure a and remember what i said about that this is what the patient is telling us in a fairly simple diary and you can see there's a big statistical difference there what I said at the beginning was that quality of sleep was important, and that was the global PSQI, and this little bit of it, the component one of it. And again, we've got very statistical significant differences, and morning alertness, of course, which is important. And the quality of life, just that's how the patient tells you they feel, how they're feeling improved. Clinical global impression of improvement, and you can see, again, statistically highly significant. There are some clinical issues in, in using these drugs, which you have to be. And I think the management of expectations is the biggest one, because the trouble is that we have been burdened by the use of benzodiazepine hypnotics, which in fact have the difficulties of ablating patients' memory and having this very sudden effect on sleep latency. So you have to very much educate both physicians and patients to accept that these are issues which have to be dealt with. And I think for any clinicians in the audience, this is perhaps one of the most important aspects if you want to use these drugs correctly. Don't encourage your patients to think that they're simple benzodiazepine hypnotics. So in summary, we've shown these drugs show benefit in insomnia. It's particularly true in the elderly. The principal impact is on this thing we've called quality of sleep. That is how well the patient feels they have slept. Uh, alertness and behavior the following day are certainly improved, and it's free from the adverse effects of traditional hypnotics. And perhaps most importantly of all, the patients benefit from the long-term use of these drugs. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>